welcome to Women Rocking Hollywood, the sixth edition, supporting female filmmakers in a post-COVID world. I'm really sorry we can't be together physically once again, but next year, absolutely, we'll all be together. And thank you so much for watching this, the uh, Comic-Con at home today. So stay tuned and stay with us. But first, let me introduce the women on our panel, all powerful, wonderful, talented women. Uh, Shaz Bennett. Uh, Shaz took tickets at Sundance at 14 and then became a programmer there. Um, and then she's gone on to be selected for the AFI Directors Workshop for Women, the Sundance Screenwriting Lab and other prestigious initiatives. She wrote for Bosch, directed the award-winning feature Alaska is a Drag in 2017 and directed on both Billions and Queen Sugar, where she just wrapped as writer and director on season six and is now attached as executive producer and writer on the new series, Sovereign. Hello, thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Um, Sean Hader uh, is a writer and director of the highly anticipated new film, Coda, coming to theaters and Apple TV Plus on August 13th. Um, the film which premiered to rave reviews at Sundance I was one of those people, uh, was the first in Sundance film history uh, to win all four top prizes at the US dramatic competition category. Apple recently made an exclusive overall deal with Hader for a series written and developed by her and a first look on feature films. Currently, she is an executive producer and co-showrunner on the series Little America for Apple TV+, which has a 95% Rotten Tomatoes rating and is in pre-production on its second season. Hi, nice to meet you guys and great to be here. Christina M. Kim is an award-winning television writer and producer. In 2005, she joined the writing staff for Lost, advancing for first to story editor, then to executive story editor over the course of her tenure on the show. She has produced and written episodes for NCIS Los Angeles, um, Hawaii Five-0, uh, and uh, Blind Spot a supporter of gender balance and inclusive casts and crews. She is creator and showrunner for CW's Kung Fu, TV's first drama series starring an all Asian cast. Kung Fu has been renewed for a second season. Hi everyone, so happy to be here. Kate Heron is an award-winning director and writer who created a number of shorts before helming episodes of Daybreak and Sex Education. Using her talent and experience, and lifelong passion for sci-fi and love of Loki. She created a no holds barred pitch and a PowerPoint that landed her the job as director and executive producer of Marvel's Loki on Disney Plus, a show that has been highly praised by critics and has broken record records for worldwide viewership. Hello, hi. <laughs> And Ebony Adams is a writer and podcaster whose work foregrounds the lives and work of Black women in the diaspora. She currently oversees public programming for women in film as part of the uh, organization's efforts to support female filmmakers through film screenings, master classes, workshops, and panel discussions. She's the co-author of History Versus Women, a middle grade nonfiction work that aims to discover the stories of some of history's most dynamic and devilish women. In her spare time, she co-hosts several pop culture focused podcasts for Feminist Frequency. Hey, everybody. Okay, so we'll start with Shaz, but first let's see the trailer for season five, which gives us an idea of where the story is headed for season six on Queen Sugar. I'm in a fight right now to keep with my daddy gaming. The Black-owned farms just received a notice invoking seizure of their land. You know this fight has just begun. The virus is here. I'm gonna need you to come home. So hard to choose. I have too much to lose. Maybe this is how we find out what we made of. I've been officially laid off. The last thing I'm gonna do is let my pride get in the way of me supporting my family. It's time I meet your family. It's never been easy. Yeah, how does it feel to be the other woman? Watch yourself, Haley. After all we survived, got his knee on his neck. Like, 
and they're picking us off one by one. You will be stopped by the police, Blue. Why? Because you black. Cause I feel like I've never felt I feel like I'm running out of time now. I... This year feels like somebody's bad dream. We can wake up though. <laughs> Open our eyes to our blessings. Love is all I need right now. We have to fight. We can't become the thing that we hate. You expect us to turn the other cheek when you have a knee on your neck? I'm You gotta bring some beauty into this ugly world. Ain't nothing ugly over here. You look beautiful. We've been through more storms than most folks will ever see. But we still here. So, Shaz, you directed on season three, and you just wrapped on season six, where you were in the writer's room, you produced, and directed episodes nine and ten. What can you tell us about what's coming up on Queen Sugar? <laughs> well, I can't say too much, um, except that, you know, it's a, I don't know if you see, if you see from the trailer, season five was, you know, um, like the last year, an incredible um, painful reckoning um, year and a lot of isolation and and we're go we're seeing it through the family you know through the borderline family so now we're coming out of that in season six and you know how does that change how does that change all of us how does it change each of the siblings and the family um, we have some new characters you know there was a few announced um, Tammy Townsend's coming as Prosper's daughter um, and Marquise uh, Rodriguez and McKinley Freeman are playing some incredible characters that I can't tell you too much about. But um, yeah, I mean, it, the one thing I love about this show is that you've fallen in love with the Bordelones from the beginning and, and each season you're just going on deeper into their lives and their American story, American family. And um, so you, you directed nine and 10. Did you get to choose which ones you directed? No, um, Ava DuVernay chooses everything, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, Ava is uh, our champion. She's the one who's brought us in, gave us these opportunities. And, um, you know, I directed in season three. Um, and, you know, to come back was incredible just because I, I was a fan of the show first. And then, you know, there's a real sisterhood in this directing group of women. Um, this season we had you know, again, she's directed, you know, often it's a, your first time was my first time in season three. This season we had uh, Lisa France was our producing director and Bertha Paysan was, uh, Sapan was uh, one, a new director, had never directed television. Um, Carmen Marone was, her, this was her second episode. Sierra Glaude, who directed last season when they only had three directors uh, during COVID and Keisha Ray Witherspoon, um, Marie Jamora, Sherry Carpenter, me, Stephanie Turner. Um, yeah, Ava chooses each of us. And, you know, it's always an interesting question where people say, wow, she really took a risk on you. And, and I think she did take a risk on us for sure. But um, it's also a question, you know, going forward, why is it risky to hire, you know, these women that are incredibly talented and we'd all done direct, you know, all these programs like you, you know, I've done the Fox program and this program and that program, you know, and, um, you know, directed a feature film and, you know, so it wasn't like any of us are, you know, just walking onto a, a, onto a set, never done anything, you know, she's selecting talented directors. You're producing and writing for the new NBC show Sovereign, which is the first Native American family drama developed for network TV. Your writing partner is Sydney Freeland, who is a transgender Navajo filmmaker, and Bird Running Water is executive producing. Um, is there anything you can re reveal about the new show or you know, tell us why you're excited about working on it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a dream come true. I've always wanted to 
work with Sydney and Bird and Ava DuVernay is also <laughs> like executive producing that. And it was an idea that Bird and, and um, Ava had, and they brought on Sydney and I, and Sydney and I have been, um, you know, developing it from, you know, for a year now. And, and we just, it's a, you know, we kind of jokingly say it's a, you know, queen sugar on a reservation. Um, you know, it's just a family drama. And, and strangely, you would think that's like, you know, so mundane, but, you know, part of it is that what's kind of revolutionary about it is that we get to see like modern day Native Americans just being in a family, you know, not a part of like, you know, cowboys and Indians, but just what's it like for, you know, regular folks. And, you know, I grew up around a lot of Indians, I'm friends with a lot of Indians. And so for me, it's sort of interesting when we talk about it people are like wow I've never seen that you know and so I mean that's what's going to be really um exciting and and we love the family a lot and I'm, we're excited to hopefully bring it you know to screens around the world okay thank you uh Sean I'll start by saying congrats as a female filmmaker for breaking the record for the top selling film out of Sundance and on the film being the first in Sundance history that took all the top prizes in the US dramatic competition category. Thank you. And all from and all from my couch. <laughs> right, right. But I, I watched you. Yeah. I, I, I loved the movie. I watched all of your, you know, when you accepted all your speeches and everything. And you guys were so genuinely authentically excited and, and joyful about it. It was a beautiful thing to see, it really was. Um, CODA, which stands for Child of Deaf Adults, centers on Ruby, who is the only hearing person in her deaf family. When the family fishing business is threatened, Ruby finds herself torn between pursuing her love of music and her fear of abandoning the parents, her parents and her brother that she loves. So we do have a clip and uh, let's show this really great clip you guys are gonna enjoy. His, you know. Right, well, so the layman's term for what you both have is jock itch. It's common if you spend a lot of time in damp clothes and it's, it's easily transferable via intercourse. I'll give you an antifungal cream, but you both have to keep the area dry and avoid sex for two weeks. So you had two ASL masters or directors as part of the production, Alexandria Wales, who was involved in the writing stage and Anne Tomasetti, who supported you during the filming. What are some of the changes that took place during the process of writing and filming through their suggestion? Um, well, first I should probably tell people what an ASL master is, because I don't know that it's like a common term that people know, but um, an ASL master is basically a, a dramaturg for ASL, for the language, and um, they're called dazzles, sometimes directors of artistic sign language, because it's not like a one-to-one -one translation, the way that, you know, you'd send off a script and get scenes back in French, like it, it it's a very, um, the, the, it's a whole different kind of language just in its syntax and grammar and everything. And so it's a real process to take writing and move it into ASL. Um, and so I had these two amazing ASL masters, Alexandria and Anne, and Alexandria worked with me basically to do the translation of the script. So 40% of the script was in ASL. Um, and that process was really interesting because we 
you know, there's no written form. So we're sitting across the table from each other and we're reading, you know, looking through scenes and, and every piece of dialogue she's signing back to me and sort of the sign with her sign choices. And then we're discussing, you know, whether those are the right sign choices and, you know, and sort of playing with different signs and trying to figure out, um, you know, how to kind of take the English and, and turn it into kind of a pure form of ASL. And so that was a really cool, interesting process. I mean, as a writer, you're literally seeing your words come to life in a whole other way. And so that was incredible. And then Anne was with me on set and um, Anne was really my deaf eyes on set. And so it wasn't just to be looking at the ASL scenes, you know, and obviously my actors were deaf as well. And so they sort of were bringing cultural authenticity, but Anne was there not only to make this family feel like a family because, you know, everyone signs differently and there are regionalisms and sign just like there are regionalisms and someone has a Boston accent, like there are signs that people use in Boston that they're not using other places. And so to really make this family feel like a family um, and then also to kind of be like cultural eyes for me on set. And so there were a lot of times I felt like where it was so important that I had deaf collaborators behind the camera with me to, you know, walk into a space and go like this living room is set up wrong. Like no deaf family is going to put their couch with their back to the door. Like that's insane. <laughs> like every, you know, living room is going to be arranged so you can see who's coming in and coming out of your house. And so these little moments, I think there were a lot of kind of things along the way that we were adjusting um, because I had those incredible, you know, collaborators with me who were also kind of chiming in creatively as well. And so specifically, there was a scene in a bar where um, Daniel Durant's character, Leo, goes out with a bunch of um, the family's fishermen and they go out um, to a bar and he's at a table with a bunch of hearing people. And I, you know, had said to Anne, can you, can you walk me through what that's like, you know, to be deaf and be at a table with a bunch of hearing people having a conversation? And she actually wrote me this incredible essay about what that experience is like and, and how hard it is to follow a conversation. And, you know, you read someone's lips over here and then someone laughs across the table and you realize you didn't quite get that right. And, and you're sort of like this detective and your eyes are darting everywhere. And she's like, and eventually I get exhausted and I kind of check out and I'll space out and watch somebody something else or stare at the ceiling. And she wrote me this beautiful piece and then I shared it with my DP. And then my DP operated camera for that scene and sort of use that essay to operate camera as though she was Leo following that conversation. And so it was just an amazing collaboration to have those people. And I think I'm a hearing person and I'm always gonna have that perspective. And so I think to have people who were there to kind of help me not be an outsider and, and share a culture that wasn't my own culture was really important. And your cinematographer is Paula Hedobro, and your production designer is Diane Lederman, which means those are two powerful heads of production that are uh, uh, women, which thank you. Um, how did um, those kinds of, you know, what kinds of, talk a little bit about those collaborations. Well, Paula, I've worked with forever. So Paula, I met at AFI. I also did the DWW, which Shaz did. And, um, and I met Paula there and she shot my first short film um, in 2006, I think. So So I've known Paula for a really long time and, and we've sort of, she shot my first pe feature. She shot another short for me. She, you know, and so we've sort of like had our careers growing separately and then come back together to work together along the way. So she's a really key collaborator for me because we just have a shorthand with each other and a way that we work and, and communicate about visual language. And then Diane had worked with me. I'd worked with her on Little America. And um, what I love about Diane is she just, both Paula and Diane were like, we're going to let this town dictate how we design this movie because the town is so specific. It's this very kind of gritty working class town on one hand. And then it's also, you know, very picturesque and nostalgic looking. And, and so you've got this like seashore alongside this, you know, kind of really working class Boston vibe. And so, um, 
so Diane just came early and she like hung out in Gloucester and went to the fishing bars with me and hung out with people and, and let the colors of like the big piles of fishing nets on the docks and those Grundens that the fishermen wear that are bright orange kind of start to dictate like the palette of the movie. Um, and I love that it was such an organic experience. I think for both the way we shot the movie and the design was just kind of experiencing the town and the people in the town and the environments and then letting that kind of affect how we were designing the film. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Christina, congratulations on the renewal of for Kung Fu for the second season. It's such a pleasure seeing a show starring an all Asian cast and one that has an Asian American showrunner. That's a wonderful thing to see. Um, it was always the plan, um, your, part of your plan to have a female lead, but the whole show is centered on powerful women and features diverse Asian uh, female characters, like for example, the doctor in Chinatown at that hospital, um, but it's really all over the show. How, do you, um, how are you working to keep that kind of balance? Well, I think it was really important in creating the story. You know, it was the story of Nikki Shen, who's a young Chinese American woman who, basically freaked out and had a quarter life crisis, ran away, ran away to China and had this life changing experience at a Chinese monastery. And the Chinese monastery is where she learned the art of Kung Fu. And I thought it was really you know, unique and interesting to have a world where this monastery was led by women. So that's where it all started. She had a Shifu who's like her trainer master who was a woman and everyone there was a woman. And it was just this powerful world where she learned to kind of find herself. So coming back to America, to her family in San Francisco, you know, I really also wanted to create a world where she's surrounded by her mom, who's a very powerful figure in her life, who presents as a tiger mom at first, but we're going to, we peel back layers on her character, you know, a sister who's kind of like the fun bubbly character, but again, you know, very strong in her own way and has gone through something very serious while her sister was away in China. And really, I want to just populate the world with strong, interesting women, just like the world actually is. <laughs> um, so that that was really my goal. And I wanted to do it in just a natural, subtle way. And I'm happy that people are, are kind of picking up on that. I love that you brought up that uh, her mom um, is presents as a tiger mom. And yet none of the characters, when you really start watching the show, are anything, any kind of cliche that that we would be used to in um, what's presented on screen as Asian characters. And they're so multi-dimensional. Um, I'm thinking of Ryan Shen's character um, that John Presida plays. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the discussions around intersectional characters like him, especially as it relates to his uh, relationship with Ryan and uh, Joe and, and Shen's acceptance of Ryan's orientation? Sure. So Ryan plays the youngest son and he's gay. Um, or actually John plays Ryan. Ryan is the character. And, you know, we wanted to talk about what that relationship was going to be in the family of coming out to the family, what happened in the family. And we wanted to honor that struggle. It's oftentimes shown on TV as, as you know, something that's not talked about in an Asian family that parents rejected immediately. And so we wanted to honor that there was that struggle initially, but there was more to it. And as we start to peel back the layers again on this relationship with the father, it was, we, we reveal that it wasn't so much a rejection, but really not, not being sure how to communicate with each other, that there was so much love and so much support between father and son that it was just trying to find how to have that conversation. And I think when they finally do in a later episode, it's just a really emotional, powerful moment um, both actors playing the dad and son, you know, just were really grateful to have an opportunity to show a relationship between father and son in an Asian American family that wasn't just, you know, black or white, that there was nuance to it. And um, it was really emotional. You have a lot of women below the line as well. Can you talk about some of those collaborations? Absolutely. Um, I think for me, one of the most exciting things about actually getting a show on the air, aside from getting the show on the air, was being able to hire, you know, who I wanted to hire. So for me, it started in the writer's room, which was really important because for almost my entire career, I was one of one or two women, which I'm sure all of you can relate to on staff 
Um, you know, when I would go on set again, I was one of just a handful of women. Um, and I wanted to change that on my show. So our room, is, there's an even gender split, which I've never had, and I just love in the writer's room. And then on the production side below the line, again, it was hiring the best people who happened to be women, which was wonderful. I interviewed men and women and the standout candidates were women um, and they've been fantastic. My production designer created the entire world of Kung Fu. The research that she did, you know, to figure out what does, would this family's house look like? What would it look like in a Chinese monastery that she'd never been to? And getting all those details right was just mind blowing to me. Um, music wise, Sherry Chung is a Chinese American composer. And we had a lot of conversations about what the music on the show should sound like. And, you know, there's different elements. I think being Asian American is always a balance of, of your Asian side and your American side. And so the music reflects that in the score. And then there's a, there's a you know, heavier emphasis on Asian instruments when Nikki is at the monastery or having a flashback to her time in China. And she's just you know, been writing this beautiful music for us, which I just love. Um, so really it's been a wonderful collaboration all around from the writer's room all the way to you know, everyone on set. And uh, when you started production on Kung Fu and you had to halt almost immediately back in 2020, um, then worked through this year um, through the pandemic, um, I'd like to know a little bit about how that impacted the stories and filming of the show. Yeah, sure. So we shot three days of the pilot and then we shut down for COVID and none of us knew what COVID really was, what it, the next year was going to mean. If we were going to come back, we hadn't been picked up to series yet. So it was a strange year, you know, once we found out the good news that we were going to get picked up, there were a lot of conversations because the world had changed and there was, you know, unfortunately a surge in anti-Asian violence and sentiment. Um, you know, there, there was Black Lives Matter and, you know, a lot of things, a lot of turmoil in the world. And certainly those conversations came into the writer's room. We, we all brought our different perspectives on it. Um, and I think it came together really well. I was, I was really happy with how it turned out. Kate, you, know. you completely wrapped on um, Loki. So, and everyone's seen it. Um, so, uh, but maybe they don't know that Tom Hilston it has been called a Loki encyclopedia. And he had what folks jokingly called a Cambridge lecture series about Loki, about the character. What, during your conversations with Tom, did you learn about Loki that you didn't know that had the most impact on how you moved forward telling the story and what I new ideas did he spark? Yeah, so, I mean, it was amazing to work with an actor that's obviously been playing a character for over, well, 10 years now. So I, I think it was exciting for me, like, when we first met, basically, we were talking and it's just so quickly you realize, because I love the character, but I was like, everything you're saying is so useful and I, I want my heads of department to hear this and we just kept talking about it and in the end I was like oh you should do like a talk for them but he did this proper like a uh, best week, yeah like a Cambridge kind of PowerPoint presentation for the cast and crew and it was great and I think that the main thing I really learned from him was that he always brought his like I guess like his A game every day to set which particularly because the second half of filming you know we were filming we, we were locked down for four months but when we went back like we were lucky to go back but none of us still really understood COVID in a sense you know and it was it was a stressful time and I think he just brought joy to the set every day which definitely echoed across everyone in the cast and crew so I think for me that's like been a big learning thing and just yeah giving something your all. So the matte painting style of the TVA cityscape the references to classic sci-fi and production design like Minority Report and Alien and Dune and uh, 2001 and Blade Runner <laughs> and, and Blade Runner is influential in the film lighting. Um, can you give us specific examples of how you worked with production designer Kasra Far Farahani and DP Autumn Durald Arkapa to create looks that are inspired by classic sci-fi and create something new while still taking full advantage of the great visual effects team. Yeah, so I think for like, I'd say between Autumn and Kazza and I, something that was really important for all of us was that the, so we set up a place called the TVA, which is kind of like 
this organization that exists outside of space and time. So it was like, okay, how do we show a place that, you know, it's not on a planet, there's no sun, um, but make it feel like a real living, breathing office space. So, you know, I went to the comics first, which has all these beautiful images of like kind of infinite desks stretching off into infinity, but then working with that, like, I think really, I mean, one thing that was important to all three of us was practical sets. Like I, I love, um, films like Eternal Sunshine or Scott Pilgrim, you know, where they they kind of have a lot of visual effects, but they kind of use those to heighten the reality. And I think the practical sets were helpful because I love doing long takes. So for example, in like the first episode, you can see, but like Tom and Owen, they step out of an elevator, they walk down a very long hallway into the room they're in for most of the rest of the episode. But we built that as a giant set. And that's something that me, Kazra and Autumn we tried to yeah make sure we had as much as possible just to kind of bring the reality of it and i think for me like the visual effects team like they were incredible and it was really just about you know working with them like whether it's that viewpoint you mentioned obviously that's very heavily practical at least on one aspect with the actors but once we push past them with the camera, like, you know, that's completely in their world. So I think it was really working with, you know, Kazra and the art department, talking through the illustrations and the intent of what we were after in those scenes. And I storyboarded, I think nearly all the show because COVID, my AD needed to know like how, how many people do we need, you know, in the back of these shots. So me, it was actually kind of amazing because I love storyboarding, but me and Autumn went through everything in quite a lot of detail um but yeah anyway that's a slight tangent but anyway <laughs> so you drew the storyboards because i did read that kazra is was an illustrator um that's where he came from before he was even doing the production design were you also drawing no so basically kazra it's like it's slightly two different kind of departments so basically storyboard i had a storyboard artist called martin mercer um and i worked with a few other board artists as well across different sequences some of them I would draw like very bad stick figures, which they would make look a bit more understandable to someone who's not me. Um, but no, with Kazra, it's more like he would do like illustrations and floor plans. So, you know, like, so we know practically what we're building, but in terms of storyboards, it's generally me working with, yeah, a storyboard artist and also the visual effects team. We'd sometimes do like, if, if there was a sequence that was very visual effects heavy, I would generally get it boarded so I could show them what I was thinking shot wise. And then we would do like a sort of 3D animation basically, which kind of then we would show to the whole team. Um, but I would be using basically in my boards, I take Kazra's floor plans for the set and I'd give that to the artist and kind of draw camera plans on it and stuff. So everyone knew kind of what we were thinking and we could all kind of work together in that sense. One of the most impressive things to me about Marvel is that they don't sexualize their female characters in costume, dialogue, or character. Um, the same is true for the costumes for um, for Loki, you know, in, in the show with Renslayer, um, Hunter B-15, and Sophia DiMartino's character. What were the discussions with the costume designer, Christine Wada, around that? Yeah, so I think something me and Christine were really excited about was you know, playing into a lot of our references, like in terms of like the eras we were playing in, which was to be honest, we pulled from like anywhere, everywhere from the 50s, 60s and 70s, but for the office, but she gave it like these little flourishes that like you'll see the shirts have like these lines here that are very unique and that's very Christine. And I think it was really fun kind of, she liked the idea I know of taking like that kind of Mad Men office look, but giving it a futuristic spin. And as people will see as the show went on, obviously we went to you know different places and we got to have a lot of fun with just building different parts. Um, and I think with the characters, honestly, it was keeping Gugu's character Renslay feeling part of the world. And that was fun for me as well, because the TVA, it's almost like Hudsucker Prophecy. There's just this really clear like hierarchy. So it was like, okay, so in the, in the comics, they're called Minutemen. And it was like, okay, so how do we, you know, how do the Minutemen dress? And like Wumi's character, for example, like she's the boss of her group of Minutemen. So it's like, how does her costume differ from the people that she works with? So I think for us, that was more like the world building in that sense. And then with Sophia, obviously, it was like building upon her character, like, you know, who who is she? And like kind of giving little references to who she's based on. So I think we had a lot of fun, like digging into all of that really. But I think it's like every collaborator, right? Like I, I remember when I pitched I had all these images and ideas in my head, but like all my HODs, when they came in to interview, it was like, 
sometimes they'd be like, I think me and Christine even had images that were the same in our pitch, like me and Kazra, but obviously like they're bringing so much more than that as well. So yeah, honestly, it's just hiring very talented people and <laughs> like, yeah, letting them go really. Um, there's both diversity and gender balance baked into the show, both in front of and behind the camera. In what ways was that part of your pitch from the beginning and why is that important to you as a director and producer? I think it's just always been important to me. I mean, I've definitely, I've, on my short films, obviously I was hiring, like kind of what everyone else was talking about earlier. I was hi not hiring, cause like it's my friends working for free. I was begging my friends to help me out on my short films, very graciously accepted. Um, but yeah, but I think it's just when I did my first few jobs, like I was the only woman on set and they were predominantly white. And I just was a bit like, this doesn't, this isn't right, you know? So like I, I think I always thought, well, when I have a chance to hire people, I'll, you know, just make sure that, you know, we're interviewing wide, widely and making sure people aren't being shut out, basically. And I know it's very important to Marvel as well across their productions. And so, yeah, so when we were interviewing for this, it was just great. I got, I think the, the thing I loved about it was I really feel, oh, it sounds really cheesy, but I feel like I like found my people because like Autumn, I've never worked with her before but I loved working with her. And I think something that was really key across all my HODs is just like what amazing storytellers they are. And they all have like a very uh, cruel sense of humor, <laughs> which I noticed they all pick on me, <laughs> but like in a loving way. But uh, yeah, but it was fun. Like, yeah, cause Autumn would come up and she just knows cinema like back to front. Like we were filming a scene once and I was like, oh, I just, I wonder how we should cover this. And she was like, oh, let's do it like the outsiders. And that's in episode five. and. I was just like, oh, that's a genius idea. So no, I think it, it was just important to me to hire people that I felt connected with. But again, just, I think it makes for a happier set and it makes for a better story, you know? And so, people yeah. knowing your movies and appreciating the history is so important to having, mm. that language is so important to be able to connect with your, with, with yeah. your, the people you're working with. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so Ebony, you brought a public service announcement that women in film made, so we're gonna watch that now. For your consideration. Three words Hollywood just can't get enough of. You know, like, for your consideration, for best actor, best director, best TV series. Hollywood, what if we considered this? For every four men behind the scenes of a film, there's only one woman or that scripts are written by seven times more men than women. And that for every 10 male directors, there's 1.2 women. Oh, and by the way, only 0.08 are women of color. Only 5% of movies in 2019 had a female cinematographer. Also consider, for every dollar that men make, women only earn 82 cents. Wait, hang on, I'm sorry, does that apply to me too? Why consider this now? After a recession, men are nearly twice as likely to be hired than women. For your consideration. Women, not for an award, just for a job. If you're hiring, consider a woman, period. So let's start with what we just saw. Um, 2020 was the banner year for female filmmakers with Coda breaking records at Sundance and Chloe Zhao's Nomadland winning at the Oscars. What were, um, there were a lot of great films by female filmmakers before, during, and now after 2020. So how do we keep the momentum going with studios opening their purse strings with in-person PR pushes and film releases? Um, I wanna say, first of all, I'm very conscious of this powerhouse panel you put together. And I think the, the thing that Women in Film is so concerned to do is make sure that there is space for creatives like these incredible filmmakers you've got on this panel um, to actually go out there and deliver their art to the world, right? Have those opportunities. One of the other things that you know we like to stress is there's there's no going back to the status quo and the normal that we had. That's that's not what we should be striving for. We're looking for like a complete transformation and upending of the industry. Um, we want more women, you know, in charge of big budget films. We want more stories that are smaller. We want, you know, independent film to flower again. We want loads more women directing episodic TV. You know, we want loads more women fronting 
um, production houses. So I think one of the things is recognizing now that we've had this like anomalous year, what are audiences looking for? What have they been denied? Um, where are the opportunities? I think Hollywood in a lot of ways, and this is not a remotely hot take, but Hollywood in a lot of ways is a very conservative industry, right? Like financially, ideologically. Um, but now that there's been this rupture, there's an opportunity to say like, you know, I love how Shaz was pointing out, for instance, like, you know, Ava DuVernay uh, hiring all these amazing directors, right? Is deliberately and actively resisting the notion that hiring women hiring women of color, hiring people who are, you know, gender non-conforming is somehow taking a chance on those people. You've got people with incredible visions, incredible resumes that they've had to fight to achieve, right? The notion that we are, and I shouldn't say we, because, you know, ain't nobody given this Black woman, you know, the, the reins to make these decisions, but that, you know, the, the powers that be who have traditionally been, you know, white cisgender men, um, are somehow granting seats at the table um, and that this is something that we should be fighting for, more seats at the table, that's not really it. What we're looking for is for there to be more tables and we want different people in charge of those tables. So I think, you know, the idea is that as we move forward, 2021, 2022 and beyond, there's a chance to be visionary and bold here and ultimately, it's what the industry needs. It's what our culture is craving and deeply desirous of. And part of that is going to be recognizing that the same old media models are, no longer work and, in fact, have not worked for a long time. And there's a chance to, yes, be successful, you know, while taking a chance, which is not really taking a chance, but, you know, giving yourself the freedom to, to make these bold decisions, which means hiring more women, you know, hiring more people of color, hiring people, you know, from the disabled community, um, you know, this, the, the art that we've been fed for so long is the product of this very narrow worldview. And it's become increasingly clear that, you know, from folks outside of the community, that's, that's not what we're looking for. It's not ever what we were looking for. And we're just going to bypass the gatekeepers and make our own stuff. So how do we give more visibility to those people who are already creating? And um, how can the folks who are watching um, get involved with or amplify women in film, both the, the nonprofit that you work with mm -hmm. and also in a larger sense, women in film like these amazing panelists that we've had today? Yeah, I think um, there should be a recognition, right? That in many ways you are supporting women in film already. You're watching Queen Sugar, you're watching Kung Fu, You've seen Coda, you know, um, everybody's talking about Loki, right? So recognize the female filmmakers who are already making the, the media that you love um, and demand more of that. But I think, you know, in the sense of supporting the organization and our larger mission to bring, you know, gender and racial equity to not just the industry, but, you know, be a force and culturally and in society. It's wonderful when people participate in our discussions. We have a whole range of public programs and career development programs that people can support by simply coming and hearing what amazing filmmakers have to say. And not just about being a woman in the industry, but about the craft. I mean, I'm fascinated. I'm listening to Kate talk about like the storyboarding process about, you know, Sean talking about like how the, the deaf dramaturges, you know, completely sort of, you know, helped build this world from the ground up. These kind of vital artistic conversations that will inspire future filmmakers, but also really, you know, feed a deep need um, in an audience to, to learn how our media is created. Um, I think, you know, being part of those kind of conversations, taking our media seriously, um, will will ultimately help the work of women in film. You know, ultimately, you know, it does us no good to expand a pipeline into an industry that's been incredibly hostile to women, incredibly hostile to people of color. That's not the industry when to get these people jobs in. So be part of those discussions and be part of those efforts that women in film is leading to actually transform the industry. Thank you all so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you 
at actual Comic-Con next year in person, live, and with a big audience that applauds these wonderful women. Thank you all for being here and for taking your time to tell us about your wonderful projects.